joining me now is the Deputy, Op Deputy Liberal Leader, Susan Lee. Susan Lee, thank you for your time this morning. What's your reaction to Stuart Roberts' resignation? Pleasure. Well, Stuart's been a good colleague over many years since he came into the Parliament in 2007. He's made a contribution on a number of fronts and he worked hard during the pandemic to make sure that the government services system paid people who were lining up at Centrelink and very concerned about their wages and all of the supports that surround that. So uh, we wish him well. I understand he has family responsibilities and it's always a big moment when you step away and of course um, you've made some commentary Andrew about who will take his place and that will be a matter for the Queensland division of the LNP. Has he got anything to fear from the Robodet Royal Commission Stuart Robert? I don't think so. His reasons for leaving are purely family and I understand that and that's something people make when they enter politics because as it's often said we're the conscripts uh, sorry, the, we're the volunteers, the family are the conscripts and <laughs> he's still got a relatively young, a relatively young family. So uh, I understand that. All, all right, I'll, I'll assume that's not a Freudian slip, Susan Lee. We've already seen Alan Tudge go. Scott Morrison also speculated to be going soon. Is this unhelpful, having so many retiring members midterm? Andrew, I've been in politics over 20 years and there's been by-elections and retirements and people stepping away both in the lower house and in the Senate throughout that time. So I don't see it as unusual. It's just part of the political coming and going of members, the decisions they make, the reasons they make those decisions, the times of their life and the times of the parliament. If Scott Morrison's going to go, though, he should probably go soon, shouldn't he, rather than cause two by-elections in six months? <laughs> Well, that's absolutely a matter for him. Uh, his compact is with the people of Cook. He's very popular there. And we often get asked this question, but uh, I always give the same answer. Andrew, it's entirely a matter for Scott Morrison and the decisions that he makes. Have you got a better chance in Fadden than Aston? We will work really hard whenever we have an opportunity to contest a lower house seat. Of course we will. And we understand that we didn't meet the expectations of the Australian people at the last election, and we're working very hard to do exactly that. But I know, for example, that the people of Fadden, many of them are self-funded retirees. They've probably seen Anthony Albanese's plan to take more of their money. And I know the people of Cook are hardworking small businesses, families and communities that are experiencing the cost of living crunch. Now in the last few weeks I've travelled from Townsville to Turak, from Penrith to Perth and I can tell you that the cost of living crunch is the same uh, to varying degrees but it's hitting hard right across the country and so we will make the case to the Australian people in any by-election in any contest that we have their back that we understand what they need to see for themselves their aspirations those of their families and right now they're not seeing it from this government Andrew they're simply not would you support Amanda Stoker running for Fadden Look, I'd, I'd support whatever decision the Queensland LNP makes. The last thing they need is me, as the deputy leader of the federal party, trying to interfere in sure. a state division. So uh, All right. I, I, I always like to see more women stepping into politics, Andrew. And I know that we have some amazingly strong women, both in the parliament and in the party more broadly. On to the budget now. Do you support or would you support a modest rise to job seeker, which I understand is coming? If you're on a low or fixed income and job seeker, we know it's very tough to live on that. The one thing you need is to be able to afford the basics. And with inflation as high as it is and no apparent plan to tackle it, that's the first and best thing this government can do for people on Job Seeker. The other thing I'd like to say, Andrew, having visited many businesses that are looking for workers, desperate for workers, signs on so many cafe windows and small businesses and manufacturing businesses, uh, back yourself. It's uh, never been a better time to get a job. When we were in government, we actually had a program called the PATH, Youth PATH program, which mentored people who were long-term unemployed into a business. So it paid the business to give that one-on-one -on -one mentoring it, and it actually added 
some more money to the job seekers fortnightly payment. And I've been into businesses where this worked incredibly well. You just need that little bit of help when you're a long-term unemployed person and you need to be backed by the business that's actually taking you on. Now the government cut that program, cut it dead. So, uh, you know, let's look at this from an employment perspective and from a whole of economy perspective and also for the best outcome of the job seeker. The government is also, uh, I understand, lifting the age at which single parents can access the pension from when their youngest child is around 8 to around 13 or 14. Will the opposition support that if it occurs? Well, let's see what the budget contains. You've got lots of intel, you always do, Andrew, so well done. But um, I haven't seen the detail of that. But the same principle applies, actually. You know, if you're in that position, you are incredibly focused on the cost of living, on what it costs you to do your weekly shopping at the supermarket, on your energy bills, which we know are skyrocketing. And I mean that, skyrocketing for both for households, your rent and uh, all of those costs. I mean, that's what is hitting low-income households. So. It's, it's just so important that the government gets this right. I should note that it's 12 months ago this week that Labor launched its campaign for the 2022 election and they said they would deliver a comprehensive and targeted plan for a stronger economy and a better society. And Labor would deliver cheaper electricity, cheaper wages and better pay. Now, by any test, Andrew, any test, Labor is failing, failing right, would, miserably. And you be, that's what you, we want to see in this budget, the plan. Right. Well, I think you'll see some cost of living relief, but will you be congratulating the government if Jim Chalmers delivers a surplus on budget night? We want to see a plan and we want to see the results. We don't just want to see a number. And if indeed there is a surplus, it will be because of the strong economy that the government inherited from us. But. A surplus is one thing. We all know it'll be a big spending, big taxing Labor budget. The question is, will it deliver that plan to tackle inflation, which is a separate matter? And will it actually take the tough decisions to reduce debts and deficits over the longer term in order that we actually bring inflation down? And all right. I don't uh, have faith that that will happen, Andrew, because as I said, we all know that when Labor runs out of money, they come after yours, irrespective of how much money they're getting. And all right. this Su is the problem. Susan Lee, the, what, the spending uh, Susan Lee will... sorry, we're nearly out of time. Susan Lee, I just wanted to ask you about the PRRT changes. What's your reaction to that, what's been announced this morning? Well, when you intervene in the energy market, you distort that market. So the real question is, will those changes incentivise investment? Will they increase supply? Or will they simply distort the market? And if you do that, you lift inflation even higher in the energy market than it already is. And we know how high it is because we know how fast prices are going up. So we'll always back households, we'll always back businesses when it comes to cheaper energy. But these are the tests. And if you look at the history of this government when it comes to energy prices, they're going up at 25 to 30%. And those are the estimates that the experts are making, Andrew. So it's okay. critical that they get any intervention right but uh, I don't trust them on that either. Okay what can we expect from Peter Dutton's budget reply speech on Thursday night? Can, it, will there be some significant policy because there's this no elition tag the government's throwing at you which is starting to stick a bit I have to say. Peter Dutton's budget reply will respond to the budget on Tuesday in a way that demonstrates to all Australians that we understand the circumstances they're facing, that we know how much they're hurting from cost of living and that we are the party that actually has the better plan to fix that. So no plan from the government. I don't expect to see one in the budget, Andrew, because I haven't seen anything to date. And I refer you to all of the broken promises that come from the last last election campaign they were in and what we're seeing today. So of course we will have a response to the Australian people that demonstrates how we back them in, how we understand what their lives are like and how we are committed to their future and their family's future. You recently went on a 16 day tour of marginal electorates. There are rumours around that you are willing to put, put your hand up should Peter Dutton continue to falter like he did in Aston. Are you interested in serving the role if it comes to that? Well, 
I am doing what a dedicated advice captain should be doing, and that is travelling and visiting the seats that we hold, the seats that we want to win back, the party members that we uh, we want to thank for their faith in us over time. And in doing that, Andrew, I am seeing an absolute crisis when it comes to cost of living across this country. So I'm absolutely delighted to be fulfilling that role as the deputy leader of the Liberal Party. It's an incredible honour. I take it very seriously. And I'm here uh, serving at the pleasure of our party room. Absolutely. But could you ever see yourself serving as leader? I want to be a senior member in a Peter Dutton government after the next election. On the Expenditure Review Committee, doing a much better job than the current Treasurer and Finance Minister. On the National Security Minute, uh, Committee, uh, understanding the role Australia plays in the region when it comes to our national security and delivering for the Australian people a strong agenda from a coalition government. All right, just finally, you and Peter Dutton recently in Albury said the Liberals were the party of the regions. I must admit I'm confused by that. Aren't the Nationals supposed to be the party of the regions for the coalition and you're failing to win the cities at the moment? Well, I just refer you to the number of rural Liberal colleagues I have in the Parliament, and there are very many. I'm one of them in the seat of Farrah, which stretches from Albury, where I am now, all the way to the South Australian border. So, of course, we, the Liberals, can be the party of regional Australia and the party of the city, because in order for us to win, we have to win 50% of the vote plus one. And within that broad church, as John Howard called it, uh, there are a range of views, and they're reflected all over Australia. They're not entirely different in the city and the country, but sometimes there are key differences between the city and the country. I'm a rural liberal because I've always believed in bringing city and country together in one nation. Susan Lee, thanks so much for your time this morning.